think it was as of 2012, 7 in 10 Americans believe ab- abortion should be totally legal, and 6 in 10 support a federal law that would protect women's abortion rights. Thank you. I'm so glad that you had that. Uh, <laughs> and to support the point that I want to make here, which is then that means that potentially candidates who are willing to go out on a limb and uh, support abortion access, are, the, 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 the constituents are there. The people um, supporting that are there if their leaders um, are willing to be brave about uh, standing up for that. I agree. At least that's my hope. I think we have to go... I mean, we live in a hyper-partisan era, right? And so I think a lot of us think in terms of who can we convince to vote for our candidate. But I do think that there is a way to make politics about convincing people um, that your policies are good, not just that you'll enact what they want you to do, but that you have these ideas and, hey, this is why you should want me to enact these policies. So I think... I, I mean, I do think that it's possible to have a candidate who could maybe sway people on that issue. Um, you know, if you have a candidate who's really well-spoken and um, can sort of do the storytelling thing, you know, where they, they have an example person that they knew, oh, I met this woman in Podunk, Ohio, and she had, you know, seven children and she was going to die if she, you know, like the like the example that they can they can use to say, hey, this is this is a reason why I support this. Or even, you know, like, I had this friend, and she needed an abortion, and she didn't get one, and it was terrible. Um, I feel like if people can make that case, like, more passionately and, and not sort of put reproductive justice on the back burner because it's, it's mm-hmm. the third rail and they don't want to touch it, then I think we could actually, like, convince more people that, you know, reproductive justice is important as opposed to just convincing them to vote for a candidate despite their position on reproductive justice. Yeah. So something that this entire conversation has sort of implicitly accepted as a frame, and and by this entire conversation, I mean the one that that we are having together tonight, Mm -hmm. um, is the pro-choice versus Mm -hmm. pro-life divide and debate. And that's not actually really reflective of the full range of possible um, ethical positions or um, like personal commitments. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, I think it's really uh, like it's troubling that uh, we have that uh, permitted that oppositional frame to mm-hmm. control the conversation so that we can't so that it's really hard to have those more complicated and persuasive conversations like what you're talking about and I really love how you talked about telling the personal stories because there is evidence that telling those narratives and connecting with people and seeing how Um, these policies affect individuals in Mm -hmm. their personal lives um, is persuasive and I'm going to recommend another book because I'm a big book (laughs) nerd and and so that's what I'm going to do tonight Um, the sea change program is the organization that put out this book the book is called untold stories the Sea Change Program is a, a nonprofit that is focused on shifting stigma around um, reproductive events. Mm-hmm. Um, and Untold Stories is a beautifully curated collection of personal narratives of all different kinds of reproductive experiences. And um, that has been designed in a, in a really lovely way to invite those kinds of personal uh, storytelling conversations about what it actually means Mm -hmm. to be pregnant, to access abortion, to not be able to access abortion, um, to not be able to get pregnant when you want to. Um, Mm -hmm. And so another plug for a book. (laughs) 
when Sarah and I lived together, our apartment was filled with books. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah, so I, I think when you ask the question, you know, how should we be talking? Like, what's the right way? And mm-hmm. what's the sort of politically advantageous way? Mm-hmm. You know, I felt very strongly during the third presidential debate when Hillary finally was, like, talking about abortion and she was saying things that as a feminist, I was like, yes, finally someone's saying these things. This is fantastic. Um, you know, but I think that turned off a lot of voters, you know, to the extent that any voters were still swayable at that point. You know, I've heard at least anecdotally people say, well, I just couldn't support someone who said that. You know, so as much as I want the conversation to move forward and as much as I want women to be able to sort of talk, not just women, I want candidates to be able to talk in a way that, you know, is is saying that we respect women and women's bodies. You know, I, I think that the more politically sort of... The way that's going to move voters the most might be to talk about how everybody would like to see fewer abortions, because we would like to see fewer abortions needed. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to provide all of those other things I was talking about, you know, that you need to provide access to affordable birth control. You need to provide affordable access to medical care while a woman is pregnant. If that's the choice, you know, she decides that she wants to maintain the pregnancy, you know, you need to be able to provide uh, child care after the baby is born and resources uh, for women, maybe even resources for young mothers to get a better education so they can support the, the child that they've had, you know, without all of these things. And as long as we have a culture of, uh, you know, where women are being raped and impregnated that way as well, like, it, you know, it's it's very difficult to reduce the number of abortions. Just making them illegal is not going to reduce the number of abortions. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think if you can also tell that story in a way that doesn't diminish the the very real reasons that people will continue to choose to have abortions, but talks about how if you want there to be fewer abortions, there are lots of things you can do that will be more supportive of women. I will say one thing I found very useful in talking to people about my position on abortion is to frame it in such a way that um, whether or not life begins at conception is irrelevant. Um, Because... In my experience, people who are anti-choice have a belief that everybody who is pro-choice thinks that fetuses are clumps of cells and they don't care about them. And if they could just see that they were living beings, then they would care. And um, one way that I like to frame it is to say, okay, let's accept your premise that a fetus is a life. That's fine by me. You can't force somebody to give up their bodily autonomy to save another person's life. If my sister was dying and she needed a kidney and I was a match and I didn't want to give my kidney to my sister, you couldn't force me to give my kidney to my sister. And a lot of people have said, oh, well, that's true. (laughs) Um, So I find that sort of saying, okay, I don't agree with your premise, but I'm willing to take it seriously Mm -hmm. is a helpful Mm -hmm. way to frame the debate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and helps to move away from talking past each other because we're starting from such totally different assumptions. Mm-hmm. I wanted to say, Kelly, that I, I completely agree with you that, of course, we should be creating the conditions under which people can freely choose to um, carry their pregnancies to term if they want to because they have access to prenatal care and to um, child care and, and all of the resources that they need to care for their families. And also, I think there's a challenge around structuring a 
conversation that is about, of course, we all want to reduce the number of abortions, a, a challenge in not recapitulating the stigma of abortion yeah. by using that um, rhetoric. Yeah, I agree. It's a, and, and that's why I feel like it may be the politically advantageous thing to do, but not the right thing to do. Hmm. Uh, and I, I'm not entirely certain how to walk that divide. But hey, I'm not running for office. It's somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running for office yet. Yet. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I think it's something that... Uh, it's just such... It's just such a big divide, right? There's just, you know, you're right, Sophie, in saying, like, if you can really hear people's problems, hear people's uh, arguments, that it's going to go a long way. But so few people are even talking anymore. And nobody talks about abortion and women's health. Like, it, it just, you know, it's a topic that everyone just stays away from if they want to keep their family members, you know, and it... Uh, so I think I, I'm trying to find ways in which we can start the conversation, but uh, but you're right. I absolutely don't want to diminish uh, autonomy and choice. There's a really great organization um, called the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice that's doing some really good work here. Um, you can find them, just Google them. They're the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Justice. And they're a group of religious people from all different religious backgrounds who support choice and work towards um, realizing reproductive justice in the United States. And I do believe um, the gentleman whose book you mentioned, Sarah, is a member as well. Um, yeah, I, I think he's, their... he's on the board, Yeah, I think. Yeah, on their website. So um, I highly recommend checking that out. They have some really good strategies and information about talking to religious people because a lot of times the opposition to abortion does come from a religious perspective. And I've found some success in that realm as well, using as, as a person who studied the Bible, using um, you know religious language and religious ideas to communicate how I feel about the issue. Well, and so since we're talking about sort of religion used as a, a reason here, uh, you know, what what about birth control? Do you have any stats? Did you look those up? Oh, um, I do. <laughs> because I just, I, you know, that's the part that I'm finding really surprising. I, I'm not surprised on the face of it that the Trump administration would roll back, uh, you know, access to to affordable birth control or free birth control through Obamacare. But I, I just can't believe that the American public is uh, on board with this. I don't like to frame things in this way because I think it cheapens the motivation, but I do. it might be helpful in talking to conservatives because you know they care about saving money. Um, this statistic says, and I get this from the Guttmacher Institute, um, in 2010, every dollar that was invested in helping women avoid pregnancies they didn't want to have saved $7.09 in Medicaid expenditures that otherwise would have been needed to pay the medical costs of pregnancy, delivery, and early childhood care. So as much as I hate to frame it that way because we shouldn't be uh, – I don't want to think of people as you know, money in dollars and cents conservatives care very much about cutting the deficit and saving money and contraception saves money <laughs> mm -hmm. um it saves the government money and it saves all of us money really because um when lots of people have lots of babies and your insurance pays out money for them then your insurance premiums go up so yeah contraception let's do it <laughs> well and you know I I remember seeing statistics probably 20 years ago of like, you know, Catholics are still people who are still sort of practicing Catholics, you know, mm -hmm. are still, uh, you know, I don't know how many, but a, a large portion seem to still have trouble uh, accepting abortion. But I don't know any Catholics who are opposed to birth control. You know, mm -hmm. there are some nuns somewhere in some, you know, something that's cited all the time in these articles, but like, the vast majority of American Catholics do not oppose birth control. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, 